to invite you to open a Bible and grab a Bible. We're going to begin in Proverbs chapter 3 in our Old Testament reading. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. And our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds. The Holy Spirit would comfort them and give them peace and open them to hear the words of the Lord. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Holy Spirit would bring to them the words of the Holy Gospel and comfort them and encourage them in their faith this morning. Finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach what is true to God's word and faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and the salvation found in his name. Proverbs 19 says, May the words of mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, my Lord and my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Proverbs chapter 3 has this incredibly famous passage for us that many of you are probably familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. Right, this is an incredibly famous statement from the book of Proverbs and one that many people recite. Sometimes we tell it to ourselves when things are not going our way, we need to change our direction, we need to change plans or whatever it might be. We say, oh, well, I didn't have God in it, right? I, I didn't put God first, I didn't do this, and so we do a little bit of repentance. But oftentimes what we use it for is almost kind of just this pithy saying of like, oh yeah, well, if I acknowledge God, he'll make straight all my paths. Right? And so sometimes we can turn this into a transactional idea. If I just acknowledge God, right? Anybody ever been in a room or a party or whatever, you'd like you acknowledge somebody by saying hi, waving to them. You're like, I know you're here, right? And then, but you didn't really get to know them. You didn't talk with them. You just, you're able to leave and say, I acknowledge that they were there. And sometimes we do this in our lives as we're following God. We're like, oh, the Bible says acknowledge God. So what we do is, God, I know you're there, or God, I love you, or God, can you help me? I'm acknowledging you, Lord, right? I said a prayer, and then what's the expectation? The second half of the verse, he will make straight all my paths, right? Everything will just go the way I want it to. And there's obviously a major problem with that way of thinking, because that way of thinking leaves us as the one who is still in charge and the one that is still in control. And I know what you're thinking is like, well, I don't have a problem with being in charge or in control. Anybody have a problem being in charge or in control? Right, you usually enjoy it, right? That's when you're more calm. <laughs> but what we're doing is when we turn this into a transactional statement, a transactional thing of all I have to do is just acknowledge God, just be like, God, you're there, that's wonderful. Now you owe me some straight path. The problem is the verses around it. Verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So another famous verse, I don't know why people say it because none of us actually like it as sinners, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So who am I not supposed to trust in then? Myself, right? But what do we do? Anybody ever do a group project in school? And you realize very quickly that the purpose of group projects is to teach you to not trust other humans because they're not going to do it, right? And so what do you do? You do all the work. I'm going to what? I'm not going to trust in my classmates. I'm going to trust in myself so I can get it done. I'm going to be in control and I'm going to trust in myself so that it'll be done the right way. It'll be done the way I want. So what we often do is we want to rebel against what God is saying in Proverbs 3. We want to, I'm the one that's going to make my own path straight because I can't trust anybody else to do it. And I can't trust God to do it. And so what we end up doing is saying, I'm going to live my way. We're going to do things the way I want to do them. We're going to do things the way I see them. We're going to do things the way I view them. We're going to live the way I want to. And every once in a while when I feel in trouble... 
I will say a prayer and acknowledge God and hope he bails me out and helps me a little bit, right? But verse five and six don't teach us that. What verses five and six essentially present to you and me is there are two ways of living in this world. There are two ways for you and I to go through this life. One is, according to God's ways, that he will be the one making the path straight and leading me and guiding me. And I know we're in church, so everybody goes, amen, that's the one we all want. And then there is the other way of living, which is, I will trust in myself above all else. I'm always right, I'm always wise, I'm always good, I've got it all figured out, and I will be the one that makes the path straight. And so Proverbs is essentially presenting us with these two options, these two roads we could go down. I can say, I'm going to follow the Lord, I'm gonna trust in the Lord, and trust him to be the one that guides my path. Or I can reject what Proverbs says and say, I'm the one that I'm going to trust in, and I'm the one that's going to make the paths straight. So verse 5, again, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. The word in Hebrew here for acknowledge is the word yada. It means to know, to understand. It, it, It reflects an intimate knowledge, an intimate relationship. So it's not just, I'm going to acknowledge God, and then, you know, I said the prayer, I went to church that one time, I read the Bible a little bit, now God owes me, and here's the transaction, I I acknowledged you, God, so now you're going to make my path straight. Except for the word yada means to actually know him. So instead of just saying acknowledge, it says, in all your ways, know the Lord. Have a relationship with the Lord, in all of your ways. Which means you don't get to go, this area of my life is the area that I control and I oversee. And in this area of my life, I will allow the Lord to be in charge of. We're often guilty of this. But Proverbs, the word of God is saying, oh, no, no, it's not just in this area. You go, okay, God's in charge here. Or I'm gonna follow God in this area of my life. No, he's saying, in all of your ways, in all of the paths you take, every step of your life, everywhere you go, know the Lord, have a relationship with him in such a way that you will follow his paths and his ways. And that sounds really good, and we're all really stubborn about it. Right? We want to rebel against this way of thinking all the time. Just on a human level, how many of us enjoy losing control and having to trust someone else to do the job? Right? And it can be the same thing in our lives when it comes to our relationship with God. It sounds good on paper. You can sit here and go, well, you know what? God's right. The word of the Lord is good. Proverbs is a wise book. You should take it under consideration. But when you leave, it's hard to say, I'm gonna put all my ways under God's authority and his direction for my life. I'm gonna put him in control and say, I'm gonna trust in the Lord with all of my heart rather than trusting in myself with all of my heart. And the reason this is so hard for us is because the way of God is totally opposite than what is natural to us as human beings and what is natural to the world. Right, we talk about in the Bible how, how we're sinners, right? We're, sinning means to be, I'm, I'm against God. I'm going against his direction and his ways. And that's natural to us as human beings. It's natural to our, our human culture and our world to say, I don't want to go in God's direction. I want to be in charge. I want to be my own person. I want to have authority, right? Anybody ever heard that? Someone shout out, well, who are you to tell me what to do? Yeah. How many of you, just for funsies, let's all raise our hands, how many of you have ever thought that or said that to somebody? I was like, who are you to tell me what to do? Yeah. Now, it's interesting when we do it to other human beings, right? It's not so interesting when we do it to God. Oh, no, you're going to trust the Lord with all of your heart, and you're going to acknowledge him. You're going to know him and follow him in all of your ways, every sphere of your life. Who are you to tell me what to do, God? 
And it's because our natural instinct as human beings is to shout that out. Who are you to tell me what to do? I'm in charge, I'm in control, I'm gonna make my own pathways here. I'm gonna live my own life. And the world actually encourages this way of thinking. Don't let anybody tell you who you are, what you can be, what you can do, anything like that. You are your own person. And the Bible says, no, you actually belong to God and you need to trust in him and his wisdom and his ways in every area of your life. In the gospel reading in Luke chapter 22, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 22. We see Jesus give us a real-time teaching and example on what does that actually look like to put Proverbs 3 into action in our lives. So in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 30, he's having a conversation with the disciples, and here's the context. This is the night Jesus is betrayed. This is Maundy Thursday. So he's gathered his disciples together for that holy night, that special night. He creates what we now call communion, the Lord's Supper. He has that special powerful meal with his disciples for the first time ever. All right, so that's the context. Imagine you're sitting at the communion railing, and Jesus goes, this is my body and this is my blood for you. Just think about that. If you were there at that table that night with Jesus himself, you're like, wow, this is going to be special. And the very first thing that the disciples say in response to this holy moment is verse 24. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. That makes zero sense, right? Jesus is like, hey, guys, this is my last night with you. I'm going to be betrayed, handed over, die on the cross for you, rise again. And here's this holy meal I'm giving you to give you myself as a reminder and as my presence, my forgiveness for you. And their response is... I wonder which one of us he thinks is the best one. Does anybody else think they're dumb? I read this and I was like, why, why would this be your argument at the first Holy Communion? Right? But here's Jesus' response. He said to them, because by the way, they're at a table with him. They're not having this conversation in secret. He literally hands them the bread, hands them the cup of wine, and then they start arguing with each other in front of him. Which one of you as us is the greatest disciple of all? And Jesus goes, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. So what Jesus is essentially saying is, the way the world works is this. People want to be in control. They want to be in charge. They want to have power. They want to have authority over other people. They want to have it over themselves. They want to have it over people around them. And he's saying, that's how the world works. In verse 26, but not so with you. That's a real big bummer, isn't it? Now, I know what you think. Like, well, Jesus said it, so it must be good. But just think about it. It's a ridiculous moment for the disciples. But we're not really any better. Right, Proverbs 3 says, no, it, trust the Lord with all of your heart. And you're like, oh, I'll trust him with a part of it. Don't lean on your own understandings, right? Just to make you feel a little guilty this morning. How many of you have ever leaned on your understanding like all the way until your world fell apart? And you're like, maybe I should say a prayer. And you're like, oh, right. <laughs> so we, we're like, Proverbs 3 sounds great until we actually have to start living it. And then we're like, no, 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 I'm gonna do it my Right? And the disciples, what are they doing? They're having a conversation. They said, this is the way the world works, Jesus. You don't get it. You gotta trust in yourself only. You can't trust anybody else. You gotta lean on your own understanding. You gotta do it in all your power. Right? And you gotta figure out, out of the 12 of us sitting here, who's the best? Who's gonna be in charge when you die? Do you understand that's what's happening? Their argument is, who's the greatest amongst us because Jesus is about to die? So who's gonna be in charge after he's gone? They missed the whole point. But from their perspective, on our human perspective, what? That's the way the world works. It's what Jesus says, he's like, that's how the Gentiles behave. That's how the world works, is how do I get ahead of everybody else? How do I have power and influence? How do I have control and authority? How do I get in control of the pathways and the ways of my life and everybody else's life? 
And then Jesus looks at his disciples, this ridiculous group of knuckleheads. He looks at you and me and he goes, but not so with you. What a bummer. Right? Anybody ever had that expression? Just you want to throw your hands in the air. Maybe you're having a conversation. We could do better. We could do this. And then people at work or in church or wherever go, that's just the way the world is, though. Right? We kind of say it as like a giving up. That's oh, just the way the world is. What are you, you going to do? Be different? Follow Jesus? That's not going to work. This is the way the world works. Any of you ever encountered these conversations? Right. I remember uh, going to a pastor's conference. There's way too many of these things, and I don't go to them anymore because they all say the same stuff. All right. <laughs> but I remember going to one, and there was a famous author and preacher, because they don't get no names at these things, right? Famous guy up there. And he, he's an awesome guy, and I remember his teaching. It was incredibly profound and helpful, and he's up there on a whiteboard, and it's in this breakout session. He's asking all these pastors in the room about leadership, right? This is what the disciples are doing here, right? Who, who's the greatest of us? Who's gonna be in charge? Jesus, pick a, pick a leader amongst us. Totally missing the point. And by the way, there's lots of books written about leadership and management and all of these things in the world, right? And so pastors read them too, and they're sh we're shouting out the answers, and he's writing all this stuff on the whiteboard, massive list of all kinds of attributes that make a good leader. And after a while, he asked the question to the group, he goes, what's missing? You know, and everybody's like, well, I don't know, man, it's like 30-something adjectives up here. <laughs> Nothing's missing. And he walks over to the other, and I'll never forget this, he, he walks over to the other side of the board and really big letters writes L-O-V-E. No one put love down as an attribute of a good leader. You know why? It's just not the way the world works. They're coming to Jesus like, look, you just gave us this meal. It's all about your love and forgiveness. You're about to die to show us your love and forgiveness. But in the meantime, can you just tell us who's the best guy? Who's the best disciple? Who's the best apostle? Why? That's the way the world works. But Jesus looks at his disciples, and he looks at you, and he says, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. Right now, the other interesting thing about this story is this is not the first time Jesus had this conversation with his disciples. In fact, it's not even the first time in the book of Luke. Back in Luke chapter nine, they're walking along, doing all kinds of ministry. Jesus has the transfiguration, right? This great holy moment where God shouts from heaven, this is my son, listen to him. He gets off the Mount of Transfiguration, he casts out a demon from a boy that's been suffering, and the very first thing the disciples say is, who's the greatest amongst us? Like, so you think like, okay, well, the first time they had to learn, right? This is now the second time <laughs> They've been sitting in front of Jesus while he's doing amazing, holy things, and they're arguing over which one of us is the best. And what I love is Jesus, in, the, in this moment where they're having this conversation, begins to tell them, just so you guys know, I'm gonna go die on a cross. And in fact, here's what, how he says it in, in Luke 9. He says, let these words sink into your ears. You ever been having a debate, conflict, friendly conversation with somebody and you're like, you're not understanding me, right? Why can't you get this through your thick head? Anybody ever said that phrase, heard that phrase? That's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. He's like, can't you guys understand what's going on? I'm going to the cross to die for the forgiveness of sins. I'm going to the cross to serve you, to suffer for you, to die for you. And the disciples go, all right, that's cool. So who's the greatest amongst us? And you get to Luke 22. Here's communion. I'm giving you myself. I'm giving you my body and my blood for your forgiveness. And that's cool, Jesus. Who's the greatest amongst us? Right? We can make fun of the disciples all we want, but we're just as stubborn and foolish because, let's be honest, how many of us are gonna walk out this door and later this week or next week stop leaning on God and start leaning on our own understanding and our own wisdom for things. It's 
So Jesus tells them in verse 26, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. And at the end of verse 27, he says it this way, but I am among you as the one who serves. Other parts in the gospels, Jesus say, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. What's his point? He's saying, look, I, <laughs> by the way, Jesus made the world. He goes, I know how the world works. The world is obsessed with the conversation that disciples are having. Jesus, that love stuff, that serving others, that forgiving stuff, that sounds nice, but it's just not the way the world works. I'm gonna get walked all over. I'm gonna get taken advantage of. I'm gonna get mistreated. So instead, the disciples have the conversation of like, well, the world, way the world works is you lean on your own understanding. You be in control. You get as much power and authority as you possibly can, and you determine who is the greatest amongst us. Have you ever noticed how much of our world is obsessed with measuring and comparing ourselves to one another to find out who's doing better? And then Jesus looks at his disciples, and he looks at the church, and he looks at you and me, and he goes, but I don't want it to be that way with my people. I want my people to actually live differently, to look weird and be strange in the world. What do you mean you're going to serve? What do you mean you're going to forgive? What do you mean you're going to love? That's not the way the world works, and our response is be, but that's how Jesus works. That's the way the church is supposed to work. In our epistle reading from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a very famous a passage where he writes about treasures and jars of clay, right? And he's talking about his life and the church life and how it looks to live as a Christian out in the world. Now, many of you know this passage and you love this passage where it's like, but we have this treasure and jars of clay. How many of you have heard that phrase before and you held on to it? Like, yeah, it's fragile, but we're weak and everything, but we've got this. And it sounds beautiful because it's very poetic language. But I think we struggle with it because here's what Paul says. I'm just gonna read it to you, 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. So where does the surpassing power belong to? God and not me and not you. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, right? Very beautiful, poetic language. It, it's usually read when we're trying to encourage one another, when we're struggling, we're going through hard times, we go, oh, great. But we don't actually like it. Just like Proverbs 3 sounds really beautiful and great and wise, but we don't actually like it. And here's why, because listen to the first part of what Paul's saying. We are afflicted. He's like, yeah, but we're not crushed, but we are still what? Afflicted. We're perplexed. Well, we're not driven to despair, but what are we still doing? Perplexed. We're still struggling. We're still not understanding everything. We're not understanding why some things happen and other things don't. We're persecuted. We're not forsaken, yeah, but what are we also still? Persecuted. And then finally, struck down, but not sure. At least we're not destroyed, but we're still being struck down. Right, so what he's saying, like, yeah, if you follow the way of Jesus, these things will happen, right? And nobody wants to sign up for it. If I told you, like, here's what's gonna happen to you this week. You're gonna be afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. How many of you are like, that's gonna be a good week, I can't wait? Like, I'm super psyched. No, you'd be like, what else do you have, pastor? Anything else? What about Psalm 23? That's a nice one, right? So here's the thing. We want, we struggle with it. We want to have the conversations the disciples were having, which is, this is how the world, way the world works. I want to succeed in the world. And then Jesus, though, says, but, the, but I don't want it to be that way for you. I want you to follow my example. I came to be a servant. I came to love. I came to forgive. And Paul says, here's what it's gonna look like. Yeah, there's gonna be times where you're afflicted because you're following Jesus and you're not going with the way the world goes. There's gonna be consequences. You're gonna be perplexed. You're gonna be persecuted. You're gonna be struck down. You're gonna be attacked. But, Paul says, 
but in the midst of that, that won't be your final reality. Because he says, but we're not crushed, but we're not driven to despair so we don't give up. We're not forsaken by God, and we're not destroyed. And the reason Paul says it's because we have a treasure in these jars of clay. Jars of clay are super fragile, and they break really easy. You and I are the jars of clay. <laughs> we're the ones that fall apart and get cracks and broken all the time because we're human. And he says, but the reason we go through all this and we're not crushed, we're not destroyed, we're not forsaken, is because the treasure that we have in us, and if you read all of 2 Corinthians 4, what you'll find is that the treasure is the light of Jesus shining in the darkness of the world. That's the treasure that we carry with us. So we don't actually change the world as Christians by going along with the way the world works. Going along with, well, that's how they all do it. We change the world as Christians by carrying around this treasure in jars of clay and saying, I know the world works this way, but my Jesus works this way. And ultimately, you and I can can do this because we have Jesus in us, and Jesus did it perfectly. Right? When he says, I came to be a servant among you. So when you look to his ultimate act of service, which is the cross, you see all the same things that Paul says about us, about Jesus. He is afflicted in every way, correct? When he is suffering and he's going to the cross, he is beaten, and it says, the scriptures say, he is afflicted on our behalf. And Paul says, but we're not crushed, except when you look at the cross of Jesus, Isaiah 53 says, he is indeed crushed on our behalf. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. You look at the cross, what happens to Jesus? Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He's perplexed. He's like, they don't, they don't get it, they don't understand. And he's persecuted on the cross. And Paul says, well, we're not forsaken. You know why? Because on the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why do you forsake me? See, the treasure that we carry This light of Jesus in the darkness is totally opposite the way the world works. It's there because all the things that don't happen to us now that Paul says happen to Christ on the cross on your behalf. He became the one who was crushed. He became the one driven to despair when he cried tears of blood in the garden. He became the one that was forsaken on the cross when the Father turned away from him. And he was the one that was destroyed Our light in us that we carry around is the good news of Jesus. When we get to tell the world, I know the world works this way, but Jesus works a totally different way. He serves, he loves, he forgives. And that's something to really share with the world. Because all all we're ever offering as Christians is the way the world already works. We're not giving them anything. And what Paul's saying is the one treasure you and I have to give to the world that is totally different than anything they've ever experienced is a Jesus who was crushed and forsaken and destroyed and killed on a cross to love, serve, and forgive all people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the one who went to the cross to give us love and forgiveness of sins to redeem us so that we would have a treasure in us that lasts for all eternity. Lord Jesus, as we trust in you and follow you in all of our ways, may we love and serve and forgive in the world so they see that you are different and that you indeed bring a message of good news and hope. Amen, we pray. Amen.